This morning we're beginning a new section in the Sunday School series on the glory of God. For those here, I have uh, handouts. And for those online, uh, I, posted, I posted it in Slack. Um, I've already discovered several mistakes with my typing. But uh, I hope to remedy that for the next week and uh, continue moving this morning. And to begin with, at the top, I've introduced this, the, this portion of our study, which is going to be on the synoptic gospels. That means Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, I've chosen the text, Luke 2.14 and Matthew 17.5, to introduce it because those texts are dealing with a manifestation or a word, glory, and uh, are key to what we're going to be looking at. Uh, so, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And next, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. The scripture above serves to introduce the lesson. However, before we get into the lesson outline below... I think it is important to stress the place of Christ in the Bible and the, the place of Christ in redemptive history, particularly as the agent of God's revelation. If you will, look down at the scripture memory verses at the end of the handout. And one of those verses is John 1.18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. That text serves to help remind us of the essential, uh, indispensable agency of Christ in the revelation of God. Uh, in Hebrews 1, it says that God has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, and Jesus told Philip in John 14, 9, He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? And uh, I was telling Michael this earlier in the week, but I remember reading, and I couldn't find the, the source, but I remember reading a biblical theology on redemptive history, and the author was just bringing out how there is so much pointing forward in the Old Testament to the coming of the Messiah and what he would accomplish in the name of God. And then after the resurrection and ascension, so much of the New Testament is explaining what happened when Jesus Christ was on earth in his humiliated state and what would come to pass in his second coming, as well as explaining what the church is for and its purpose. But much... Uh, of the Bible, I would say uh, it's almost uh, like you can't go too far with it because Jesus said, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, but it is these that testify of me. So all these texts should help and serve to remind us that we need to pay special close attention to the life of Jesus Christ. To his words. And I don't mean that to the exclusion of the rest of Scripture. It's all equally inerrant and infallible. But there's a reason why we have four accounts of the same ministry of this one person, because this one person is the only begotten of the Father. So uh, I'm hoping that our flyby of the Gospels will. Uh, lead to your edification and further equip you to seeing God's glory through Christ in the New Testament. And now um, I want to give you some limitations of this approach. So what I'm planning to do is not look at this in a canonical format. That means Matthew first, Mark next, then Luke, then John. Because they're often overlapping so much since they're synoptic, I would be repeating the same accounts. So what I've chosen to do is take events, uh, major events like the incarnation, the, the uh, birth narrative, 
and look at them together on that and then do so with the transfiguration, the second coming and on to the cross and the resurrection. And that way it might uh, go easier in our understanding of how the, the, it's arranged, but I'll be using Luke ahead of Mark and Matthew at times. So just to give you that limitation, it's more of a chronological, historically speaking, rather than canonical approach. And I haven't put in the cross into this handout or the resurrection because I'm going to set that aside for the study with John, which will be the third week from now. So if you're wondering where is the cross, you know, uh, it's going to get a, almost a lesson all on its own. So that's coming. And then uh, the main skeleton or railroad tracks we're running on to, to grow and, and to study the glory of God in the synoptics is basically looking at the word doxa, which is uh, the Greek word for glory, or it's the Greek word translated for glory. And then the Septuagint will translate kabod or kabod into doxa. So even the Septuagint uses that Hebrew word that Noel was teaching on and to doxa. So that, that's a key word that I think is uh, helpful, but it is limited when we do a word study um, or we're, we're kind of tying ourselves to one word. We're limiting ourselves. So I want that to be known out front. And I even put a warning later on. So having said all that, uh, let's move to the, the lesson. First of all, point one, God's glory revealed in a key word, doxa. That's a transliteration. I didn't put it in the Greek form. Uh, the semantic range is fairly broad when you start to look at its usage in the New Testament or the synoptics. When you look up a authoritative source on that Greek word, the bdag, you get three general definitions for the word doxa. One is the condition of being bright or shining and can be translated radiance or brightness. The second definition that this dictionary gave was a state of being magnificent or greatness or splendor. And then definition three was uh, when you glorify or glory, you honor as enhancement or recognition of status or performance. Like uh, you would use this word and translate it. You could translate it in this usage, recognition, renown, honor, fame. So with those three in mind and those, we're not limited to those. Uh, men make dictionaries and they seek to observe what usage is in whatever literature they're looking at and try their best to give you a, a faithful representation of what they think that semantic range is, but they are fallible. We must tie ourselves to Scripture. We must not pigeonhole ourselves into a dictionary and say that the Bible can't operate outside of that because men said it had to operate within it. No, if, if you're seeing something in context and you're using proper hermeneutics from the Bible and you see, I don't see this in the dictionary that's a warning, but it's not necessarily a stop. So uh, let's look at a, a, some usages of this word just to get familiar with it. Matthew 4, 8. And then we'll look at the birth narrative. And I'm going to move pretty fast through these narratives since we started a little late or through this, um, you, this survey. But in Matthew 4, verse 8, we see the word doxa. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and their doxa. I'm going to continue to use that word doxa because it helps, it helps uh, introduce something foreign to your ears and it, and it kind of prevents you from in, investing everything with all your knowledge of the word glory just to remind you to think biblically and to go to the context and think about it. So in this sense, I, I think it gets me, what the devil was trying to do was show Jesus the greatness or the state of the magnificence of all these kingdoms as a whole and, and, and as a whole looking at these kingdoms, their immensity. 
uh, because he, he, uh, he, he, the kingdoms of the world and their glory. So it's looking at all of them in that sense. Go to, uh, so that, that's an, a usage of the word doxa. So go to Matthew 6, 13. And this is Jesus' uh, Lord's, the Lord's Prayer. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's <clears throat> um, not an easy one to interpret. Yours is the glory. Uh, however, it is in line with kingdom and power. So um, I, I think it's relevant or in the context uh, focusing on this attribute of God's power or uh, his power being pronounced in the summary of his attributes. Um, and sometimes the word glory gets that uh, connotation uh, when used in the Bible. And this is a time where one of those three definitions I gave you out of the dictionary don't really fit very well. Uh, yours is the kingdom and the power and the, and the uh, magnificence forever. Yeah, that could be it, you know. Um, but I... I I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not 100% on that one. I just am giving you what I understand from context that I think it's relevant to his attributes. And if we had to, to try to use one of those definitions, it would be more like magnificent or greatness. Um, go to 629. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his doxa was not arrayed like one of these the lilies of the field and how God clothes them. Well, Solomon, uh, when Jesus references him, he was at the height of Israel's glory. Uh, the kingdom of Israel uh, had, when it had Solomon at the height of his, uh, his reign, he was endued with and uh, given wisdom from God he was blessed with riches of abundance to where uh, precious metals were considered like rocks. Um, and people from afar wanted to come and hear of Solomon. And I think in this sense, the word doxa is speaking of that second definition. Uh, he was in a state of greatness and splendor, a state of magnificence at the height of of Israel with their order, their possessions, his wisdom, just being noble. Um, go to Mark, or, or no, Matthew 24, 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This another one is difficult with it's uh, combined with great and power. So uh, it's coming when Christ is coming in great power and great glory. Uh, and other texts say he comes in the glory of his father. So um, if I had to speak of this one again, I would probably if I had to use the BDAG, I would go with number two. But I think it's more than just being magnificent. I think it has a, a, a sense of him coming to reign and, and um, take power. It's not just the sense of him being great, but him actually uh, coming with a certain authority and power to fulfill uh, that uh, coming. Mark 8. Let's go to Mark now and just look. We're just still looking and surveying this use of the word Eight thirty-eight. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Uh, that one's similar. He, he's coming 
in the glory of his Father. Uh, again, I would say that this is not brightness or bright, uh, shining. Uh, it's not him having recognition or fame. It's dealing with his greatness and his splendor. And um, Luke chapter 2. Verse 9. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. That takes on a different sense. I hope you can see that. It's not coming in the greatness of something. It's using a, a shone. And that word shown there, we can look, it's used one other place, and you'll probably be able to pick it out once we get there, but... Uh, that one, I would say, probably falls more in the line of definition one, where it's like the condition of being uh, bright or shining, a radiance, um, similar to the Shekinah glory or the glory cloud on the Mount of Transfiguration, though maybe not identical. It just says it's shown around them. So it's some external manifestation that God is choosing to uh, act, uh, to give weight and gravity to the situation and the words being spoken. Uh, I'm just going to stop there. You, you're getting a sense now of this word doxa. I have a warning here. Word studies are necessary. That's kind of what we're doing. We're running along this track of this word throughout its key uses. And we might get a really good grasp of this word, right? Well, word studies are necessary and helpful, but they're limited. They are limited by the author's contextual usage or use. Word studies help build, help build a systematic doctrine, but do not usually explain the whole of a doctrine. Also, authors do not always use the same words to describe the same thing. For example, Mark uses the word doxa, glory, in Mark 10, 37, whereas Matthew of the same account uses the word basileia, kingdom in Matthew 20, 21. So take a look at Matthew 20, 21. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. Basileia, kingdom. But look at Mark. Go to Mark... 10.37 They said to him, Grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. So Mark has chosen the word doxa, whereas Matthew chose the word basileia, kingdom. And what that helps to teach you or to remind us is that if we just focused on doxa, and say, well, I got a good understanding of the of the of the, the definition of glory in the New Test or in the the Synoptics. Well, did you know, sir, that your understanding is limited now, because the authors will address that concept with other words, and sometimes not necessarily with one key word, but with a whole series of words or imagery. So there's a lot of ways in which the Bible can reveal to us the glory of God. And the way we are taking is helpful. It will help us build a systematic doctrine, but it's limited. And we just need to recognize that as we go along. Um, and interesting, Matthew doesn't use the word doxa a whole lot. Very limited. John, he's just like a whole bunch. Like if you look at a list of all the uses, John, he just takes them up. Luke, he's pretty good. But Matthew and Mark, very little. But but. Matthew uses the word kingdom a lot. So uh, I'm just giving that to help us. I don't want to just give you a fish. I, wanna, I want us to be helped to know how to fish. Uh, God's, okay, so let's look now at the birth of Jesus. God's glory revealed in the birth of Jesus. And we're going to look at that word doxa in some key places, some key primary texts. So let's start with Luke 2, 9.
And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. That's the text. That's the word glory. We want to grow in our understanding of the glory of God, and we want to use this text in context in thinking about the birth narrative to, Lord willing, grow in our adoration and knowledge of God, that our communion might grow. So, first of all, they were greatly afraid when this event occurred. The angel, an angel of the Lord appears to them. These are shepherds. Um, think about it from the perspective of the angels who are getting ready to worship. They have been waiting and looking into these things. And they are, one is given the privilege of delivering a message to these lowly shepherds. And it is a glorious day to be able to have the privilege of serving God Almighty and go deliver this message that has been long awaited. And they come to him and they immediately say, now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over the flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. These angels are praising God. And the reason why is the content of the message is what God is doing and who it is that has come. It is in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And initially when this happens, the shepherds are greatly afraid. Uh, this is a common response to a manifestation that God chooses to give of his own glory. He has intrinsic glory, which he possesses apart from any show or display or extrinsic working of it. But he, in that glory, extrinsically uh, manifests his name to others through displays of works and words and people and things. And... Even this, this uh, light, which I, it doesn't say light, it says the glory of the Lord. So I'm not 100% what that means, but it's the glory of the Lord is shining around them. And this angel in his angelic majesty is standing before him in whatever way the angel appeared. And they're greatly afraid. If you look at Matthew 17, 6. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. What did they hear? Verse 5, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. The gravity of the situation, the holiness, power, and intrinsic glory which God is and possesses when manifest in however way he chooses to manifest it in these ways is when it comes into contact, when men come into contact with it, they are terrified, absolutely terrified. Um, you look at Acts 10, verses 3 to 5. 
This is Cornelius in a vision. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of the Lord coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So it's not just the presence that's being manifested. Um, I think that there's this element, too, of our sinfulness. Um, if Adam, in a state of innocency, did not run and hide until after the fall, um, the Lord had to call out for him, where are you? Uh, the Lord created man that he might be a steward of his creation and walk with him, commune with him. And not that we shouldn't have a, a healthy, God-honoring fear regardless of what state we're in. When we have a sin nature or remaining sin, it only inexplainably amplifies and exponentially it increases the fear by adding this terror uh, to it because we are in opposition to God's nature with that remaining sin or that sinful state. So uh, I think it's a combination of just the glory and greatness of the situation, the gravity that's being communicated through this presence, the presence and startling factor of the angel and him saying these words and just that, but as well, uh, a, a recognition of their own sinfulness. And God is a consuming fire, you know. Um, and they're afraid. So this should teach us something about God. You know, it, it teaches us that um, God is gracious to reveal a manifestation of his glory in these ways to help signify the importance of situations. So God's grace is on display, but also God's holiness um, and God's power, his righteousness. And it says it's shown around them. The only other place that that verb occurs is when uh, Paul had the, I don't remember the word, and I don't want to go there for time's sake, but he had the light that shone around him. Um, but let's keep moving. Let's go to the same account, but look at Luke 2.14. How do the angels respond to the message? Glory to God in the highest... And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. What was it that the angel, that angel of the Lord, communicated in the message before the praise? It was good tidings. Um, I bring to you good tidings of great joy which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The incarnation. The Son of God who is of one substance with the Father, uh, who is co-eternal, co-power, the, the, the equal in power and co-eternal. Uh, the Son of God, through whom all the worlds were made, um, who has no beginning, uh, has come. He has come in the likeness of sinful flesh, a body the Father had prepared for him. And he has come, as it is written in the book, to do your will, O God. And he has assumed, in the divine nature has assumed humanity and without being confused they are two natures and one person and it's for the purpose of salvation 
It's for the purpose of mediation. And the angels understand that to some infallible degree because they praise God for it. It's not just the fact that God's performing what he promised. They're praising God for the reality of this good news. And on earth, peace. They're praising God. They're thinking these, these, the sinners that God promised all the way back with Adam. God is fulfilling it. And they're rejoicing. They're praising God that he's coming to manifest his power and grace. Glory to God. And this word doxa here isn't a manifestation of God's glory. It's a reciprocation from the creature back to God. It's not man adding to anything to God. Uh, that's impossible for man to do. God is unchangeable. He's all sufficient. I say he needs no one. He never has relationally or otherwise. But God's glory uh, is intrinsic. He possesses it. And then he communicates some degrees of it and then expects and causes it to be uh, reflected back through praise and worship. And in doing that, of course, this is inseparable from Jesus Christ uh, in true worship. There is communion. And there God's glory is manifested as well. That God is a communing God. Uh, and the angels are worshiping God. Um, I, I've thought about that before, you know, like I hate that when I think that way. But I think about God's not needing anything and him being sovereign and glorious and all powerful. And uh, the thoughts ran across my mind like uh, in temptation. Why does he want praise when he doesn't need it? You know, I don't know if anybody else has ever thought that, but that's, I've thought about that, you know, and uh, that is um, God isn't like, how can I put it, passive and self-sufficient in his passivity. He's active. He's, uh, the Bible uses the words like fullness and abundant. And he's just super abounding in power and uh, infinite in grace. And um, of course, righteousness. And in those vessels of mercy, he is uh, exercising his own works in accordance with his own nature and, and bringing others into this glory to some degree through his son. And in that doing that is an aspect of his glory. So it's a, a marvelous thing. And uh, it takes us back to the, our triune God. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick. What time are we over with? 9.45? Okay. Sorry. Uh, let's see. It was... Uh, yeah, all right, here we go. I, I saved it. Oh, here we go. God displays his grace, and in displaying his grace, he brings glory to himself. Furthermore, the whole Trinitarian plan of redemption displays this goal, as seen in the mutual glorification of each person of the Trinity. The glorious Father sends the glorious Son, who voluntarily humbles himself and glorifies the Father through his incarnation, obedient life, and substitutionary death 
In response, the Father glorifies the Son, resurrecting Him from the dead and exalting Him to the highest place. The Father sends the glorious Spirit who glorifies the Son. And all this redounds to the glory of the Father. Uh, there's this, this the, uh, you've heard of us being given to the Son and the Son sanctifying us justifying us, sanctifying us, ultimately glorifying us, and then us giving us back to the Father. We are like the object that God is choosing to use in His love and His inter-Trinitarian uh, uh, manifestation of His glory, and yet we're not just objects. We're rational beings that God's made that we might know this and communicate with Him and worship Him in the midst of it. So, um, very intimate and communal. It's not, it's not, you know, just ideals that, that are an abstraction to one another and they're not personal. But yet, those ideals are true and unchangeable. So, it's, you know, it's very deep. But I think that that's helpful, worth saying and, and giving you uh, food for thought. Let's look, though, now at uh, so they're reciprocating when they use the word doxa, and that's a form of exaltation, of praise, of glorifying God. They're not adding to him. They're praising him. And it's, it's a form of just uh, revealing or stating what is a reality for the uh, purpose of revealing his name to others, not even primarily, but that's part of it, but also just... It's just like an outpouring of joy and of rejoice. It's like you're left no other avenue but to worship him. And you don't want it any other way. Uh, so that's what that glory use there is. Uh, let's look at Simeon now in Luke 2.32. And then we'll close and look at the remainder. Luke 2.32 A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And I'm going to read before that now. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all the peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. So what does this word glory mean here? It's the, this could be translated two different ways. Either uh, glory and revelation are two different ways of describing the light or the light of re to bring revelation and the glory are two different ways to talk about his salvation. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Go to 32. A light and the glory. Is that what the glory is referencing, the salvation, or is it referencing the light? Another interpretation would say, a light to bring revelation and a light to bring glory. So both, then, then the parallelism is between revelation and glory, and both of them are synonyms for light. But another way is to look at it as light and glory are synonyms to describe salvation. And I think Isaiah 60, verse 1, kind of clarifies it, if you'll go to Isaiah. Arise. And, and I'm going to read before it. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. My covenant is with them. My spirit is upon you. Arise. 
shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Here, the light and the glory are paralleled. And back in Luke, if we ask the question, does it fit contextually here, knowing that Simeon only had his Old Testament and he, according to the scriptures, was looking forward to the coming Messiah and knew that the Messiah had come, knew that Isaiah 60 and that long section of prophecy was pointing toward the Christ, says, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to Gentiles, to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. I believe that both of these are parallel. The parallel is between light and glory, and both of them are uh, synonyms for salvation. And if we think about what does light do when we think of it as a figure of speech in in Revelation, like two Gentiles. Well, the Gentiles were outside of the covenant. They had not been given the oracles of God. They were ignorant of the things of God. And Jesus Christ, we know this, that this great mystery has happened when Jesus Christ comes and then ascends and the Holy Spirit's given and the, the, food, the blanket and all the animals come down to Peter and, and God is spreading the gospel out to all nations. Uh, so we know that Jesus has come as a light to the Gentiles, that's a saving light, a salvific, revelatory light. They are ignorant, blinded. He grants them power by the Spirit to be volunteers and opens their heart and minds to see His glory and the need for His salvation. And in so doing, they trust Him and Ha, they already had occurred the benefits having been brought into union with him, but that salvation is described as light here with reference to the Gentiles because they are ignorant. Whereas the Israel wasn't ignorant in the same way the Gentiles were. So the salvation that goes to ethnic Jews, not all, but some like Paul or Luke, that those, those Jews who do receive the salvation from Christ, for them, it is their glory. They had always hoped in their Messiah. They always looked forward and for a Jew to know this is my Savior. This is the one, when I read my Bible, that, that was promised, He's my glory. The glory of your people, Israel. Jesus. You know, uh, who was it? John wrote when he, this is what he wrote when Isaiah saw his glory. He knew Isaiah was in Luke 12 or John 12 was seeing the glory of Jehovah, who was Jesus. And that Jehovah is his glory in that sense. So what I'm just pointing out is it doesn't need to be worded as light for Israel in the same way. Okay. So having said that, uh, that word glory there is dealing with salvation. And it's particularly the glory of your people, Israel, that which makes Israel uh, majestic is their savior. Uh, so <clears throat> I hope that helps. Now, just to since we only looked at just a couple words in a couple places, um, I feel like it would be disservice to not mention the incarnation and not uh, review it briefly. Um, and let me let me just read this. The and think with me. Be reminded, brothers, sisters, the Son of God the second person in the Holy Trinity, being very and eternal God, the brightness of the Father's glory of one substance and equal with him who made the world, who upholds and governs all things he made, did when the fullness of time was come, take upon him man's nature. 
and with all the essential properties and common infirmities of it, yet without sin. Being conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary, the Holy Spirit coming down upon her and the, most, and the power of the Most High overshadowing her. And so was made of a woman of the tribe of Judah, of the seed of Abraham and, and David, according to the scriptures, so that two whole, perfect, and distinct natures were inseparably joined together in one person without conversion, composition, or confusion. Which person is very God and very man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man? Um, John Gill, in giving an illustration of how the father prepares the body and, and enters into covenant with the son and um, sends him. And the son assumes this humanity, uh, uh, doing the will of the father. And then the Holy Spirit uh, overshadowing the womb of Mary and conceiving Christ in her womb. The Son of God taking on the, the material of this woman's womb and adding to himself humanity. So in talking about all three of these, he had an illustration because all three persons are at work in the incarnation. And it's simple. He said it's like three virgins concerned in working a garment uh, but only one of them puts it on. So uh, this garment is worked in a sense, the, the, the reasonable soul and body of Jesus Christ, and then Jesus Christ adds it to himself. And he becomes two natures in one person. Uh, God's glory is revealed, in one, and this is also uh, a quote or I got from Gil. But here's some things that are re revealed from God. In, these, in the incarnation. God's glory revealed in one of the causes of the incarnation, namely the love of the Father and of the Son to mankind, 1 John 4, 9 and 10. And this is the love of God. The love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his Son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And allow me to say more. One end of the incarnation was, and here, here are these different glories that are revealed in the incarnation, to show forth the glory of God in it, the glory of His grace and His kindness and His goodness to men, in the mission of His Son in this way, the glory of His faithfulness in fulfilling the promise of it, the glory of His power in the miraculous production of Christ's human nature, and the glory of His wisdom in bringing it into the world in such manner as to be free from sin, and, and the timing, the perfect wisdom of God's redemptive plan. People will say, it, when is he coming? As if it's not soon enough. And some people say, as if they wanted to wait longer. It, it's perfect. Everything God does in his redemptive history is perfect. The time that Jesus Christ came was absolutely perfect. God's wisdom is on manifest display. And so fit for the purpose for which it was designed and all this that God might be glorified in his perfections as he was by angels, by Mary, by the father of John the Baptist, by Simeon, and as he has been by saints in all ages. Luther said, all praise to thee, eternal God, who clothed in garb of flesh and blood does take a manger for thy throne. While worlds on worlds are thine alone. Hallelujah. And we know it's, it's to come to bring glory to God and to be the propitiation for our sins as a means of doing that. But um, I'll leave it there. And uh, we'll pick up with God's glory revealed in the transfiguration and the second coming next week. Father in heaven, uh, we uh, praise your name. I thank you for this study that uh, our elders have directed us toward, and I thank you for giving them the grace and wisdom to do it. I pray that um, we as a congregation uh, would acknowledge where we uh, do not take advantage 
of this means of edification and that you would bring that knowledge of sin to us that we might repent and grow. And I thank you, Lord, for the study and interest in meditation and prayers where you are preserving us through, uh, through the worship of your people and through uh, Bible studies such as this. Please help us to grow and continue to grow that we might increase in faith and righteousness and bring glory to you um, by being like the angels there with the shepherds and praising you, glorifying you. Lord, we are blind. Help us to see, Lord. Help us to uh, grow in our sight. No, we're not unconverted blind, but help us to grow. I pray these things in your son's name. Amen.